Now, this is a slide that was shown in a case that I was in, <clears throat> a case in which Kaiser Health Plan sued Pfizer for allegedly fraudulent marketing of its drug Neurontin. And um, you'll see that uh, Kaiser prevailed. <clears throat> but this is how extreme the, um, the divergence between research and medical science and the marketing goals of the drug companies is. It's just laid out in black and white. And uh, I don't wanna spoil my punchline here, but this slide was uh, created by a medical marketing and communications firm for Pfizer to assist in its selling of Neurontin. And this slide was a key, and the slide and the behavior reflected in the slide was a key component of Pfizer having been found guilty of racketeering violations, racketeering, like anti-mafia litigation uh, law. Um, and this was the first time that a drug company, had, this case was the first time a drug company had ever been found by a jury to be guilty of RICO, RICO violations, not just fraud, RICO violations. So, this is the communications company telling Pfizer how to be successful. And what they say is that you must align the marketing and the scientific key messages. So what happens when there's a new drug, the marketing people will develop key messages that in their, based on their focus groups and polling and, and talking to doctors and so forth, they develop key messages that if they are supported, will op will will optimize sales of the drugs. It's like talking points for a political party. It's just like talking points. So they develop these talking points, which don't necessarily reflect the truth. They reflect the most impactful statements that can be made, but they don't have to be made based on truth. So this is what happens when the scientific data is analyzed and published. And it's not what is published has not been coordinated with the key messages that the marketing people have developed. So this is independent, independent continuing medical education and publication plan. So here we go. So here we have marketing messages are developed, the messages that will sell the most drugs, and they're put into slide kits for continuing medical education and they're put into symposia presentations, and they're put into medical journal articles, proceedings and monographs. These are marketing messages, but they haven't been coordinated with the study data. Now, you may be thinking that study data is objective, that it is not subject to the marketing needs of the commercial sponsors, but that is not the case. So in this situation, where the study data is independent. And uh, based on the data, there are abstracts and posters, and that gets turned into manuscripts that are published in uh, medical journals. But here's the problem. If you allow the study data to be independent of the marketing messages, then you get inconsistent key messages. The manuscripts may say one thing, but they won't reflect the marketing material that's based on the key messages. Now, the company, the marketing company, offered a solution to this problem. Instead of having the study data going straight into the abstracts and posters and manuscripts, <clears throat> they put the study data, had to go through a filter of the marketing messages. So the doctors never got to see the study data that wasn't consistent with the marketing messages. And once you do that, then you do the abstracts, the posters, the slide kits for the drug reps and the key opinion leaders and presentations at, at the professional meetings and the manuscripts and the publications. And aha, key messages are aligned. And this is the goal of the marketing and communication company that Pfizer hired to help them coordinate this. So the goal is to pass the study data through the filter of their marketing messages before it ever gets incorporated into any scientific or marketing material. And again, 
this concept is a key part of Pfizer being found guilty by the jury of racketeering violations. <clears throat> so the final upshot, and again, in the question and answer period, I would love to know how many folks in the audience know that this happened. Here's an article that was in uh, Reuters. It didn't make it to many newspapers, but US juries in Iran ruling to cost Pfizer $141 million. So Pfizer was ordered to pay $47 million to, uh, Pfizer was ordered to pay $47 million to Kaiser. The penalty is tripled because of the RICO violations. Pfizer appealed the decision and lost the appeal. So Pfizer paid $141 million. Um, that is what is going on. And the most shocking thing of all for, for me is I was an expert in this case. I testified for a day and a half in federal district court. And one of the most important discoveries that I made going through the actual data on the uh, Pfizer trials of Neurontin was that the most important trial of the efficacy of Neurontin for diabetic neuropathy, diabetic uh, nerve pain, um, was a study that uh, was called a forced titration study. So the people, uh, 160 people were randomized to take Neurontin or a placebo. And the people who were randomized to take Neurontin, their dose was forced up to 3,600 3, milligrams per day. That's twice the FDA approved dosage. And it turned out when you, when you basically make people take twice the FDA approved dosage, 55% of them have side effects. And the uh, conclusion of the article was that neuron, people who took Neurontin had less diabetic nerve pain than the people who took placebo. And uh, Pfizer hired a PR firm and they created 85 million impressions of this study amongst Americans, including physicians. <clears throat> and it got embedded, permanently embedded in Americans' consciousness that Neurontin, generic name gabapentin, is effective therapy for diabetic uh, nerve pain. Even though in trial we showed, because we were in trial, we could get the underlying data and we showed that when people, when the pain scores were calculated for the visit, the clinical trial visit before people developed side effects, there was no significant benefit. And what happened in this study is people were forced to take a dose that was so high that half of the neurotin group became unblinded by side effects and figured out that they were on neurotin. And that affected, that, that's why we have double blind studies. And um, this turned out not to be a double blind study because their forced titration uh, study design unblinded it. Yet, and we, we presented this, I testified to it in court and um, it was uh, integrated into the decision, the guilty verdict. Um, and a statistician who did these calculations in, that I worked in conjunction with published it in a rather arcane um, statistical journal. And virtually no doctors understand that this, the study design was jerry-rigged to produce success. And that when you untangle the bias of the side effects, there's no benefit. People don't understand that. And Neurontin is still uh, between the sixth and 10th most frequently prescribed drug in the United States most of it, 80% of it at least, off-label, much of it for diabetic pain, and that study was fraudulent. Pfizer was busted for racketeering violations. And yet that, that so-called knowledge is sticky. So the situation we have, <clears throat> this is a wonderful slide that um, an artist redrew for me. It was in the British Medical Journal originally, and they gave me permission to use it. But here we have a doctor, a well-meaning doctor in his boat, 
which is uh, named scientific evidence. And his doctor bag is back here and he's looking with a, a telescope and he's looking at the information. He is a good doctor or she, let's make her a female. Uh, she's a good doctor. She's look, trying to practice evidence-based medicine and she's looking for all the information she can get. And what does she see? She sees the publicly available documents that are the very tip of this iceberg. She sees the peer reviewed journal articles, clinical practice guidelines, drug company marketing, medical journals, all this public information. She doesn't know, like almost all the doctors in the United States, she doesn't know that the peer reviewers who review articles like this forced titration study that I'm telling you about, she doesn't know that the peer reviewers haven't been able to see the underlying data, which we're gonna look at under the water. She doesn't know that peer reviewers don't get to see the real data. They have to trust the drug companies, the sponsoring uh, companies um, uh, word that the brief data summaries that are included for publication are accurate and complete. She doesn't know that, that it hasn't been verified. And clinical practice guidelines, she doesn't know that the experts who write clinical practice guidelines don't get to see the underlying data. So we're gonna look at the uh, cholesterol guidelines in a minute, <clears throat> but um, um, uh, the, the cholesterol guidelines, which recommend that literally half of American adults above the age of 40 take a statin. She doesn't know that the experts who wrote those guidelines didn't get to see the data from the underlying studies. She didn't know that. And the drug company marketing, we just saw in this Neurontin trial, the forced titration trial, that the marketing included hiring a PR firm that brought that information about the faux efficacy of Neurontin for diabetic neuropathy to 85 million Americans, she doesn't know that that wasn't true. And the reason why she doesn't know it is because A, she can't know it. She can't know it. The only reason why I know it is because we had, uh, as working as a plaintiff's expert, we had discovery and subpoenas and we could get the information we needed, <clears throat> literally get the hard drives from Pfizer's executives and marketing people and scientists. And we could piece it together. In these cases that I was in, often there were 20 million documents and we could figure out what happened. So what's be below the surface of uh, the uh, waterline is the non-public information. The uh, case report forms are, are filled out by usually by nurses who follow the patients along and do their follow-up visits. And then these completed case report forms are turned into electronic patient level data sets. The data sets are turned into um, usually several thousand page clinical study reports. She doesn't know that you can't see these, that these are not released. The drug companies own this data and they don't have to release it. And the FDA doesn't release it. She doesn't know that. All she knows is what is public information. And she believes, as almost all American doctors do, that they're doing their job for their patients by relying on these public documents and not understanding that these documents that are invisible to them, owned by the drug companies, proprietary information, she doesn't understand that she cannot know what happened in the study without access to these studies. So if we go back to the <clears throat> four principles of bi the biomedical paradigm, we have to add a fifth principle now, marketism, which the principle says the value of new knowledge is determined by the market, by how much money is gonna be able to be made for the investors rather than the contribution to public welfare. <laughs>